I know, pastors that I know, uh, Matt and I know, Seth know, and we've all gotten together and uh, have said we want to help our community, the faith, want, the faith folks want to help the community, so we're able to feed the public school kids in Fredericksburg. They shut down the schools for the rest of the year, so there's going to be plenty of opportunities. You can go to our website and click on our Facebook, and Grab and Go is that ministry. We call on it Grab and Go. Click on that. It will direct you to uh, the website and direct you to the site to where you can sign up, and many of you are doing that. That's a blessing. We were out there on Monday, and it was just a blessing to give the kids, you know, uh, sandwiches and drinks uh, so they can uh, have their lunch because many of them don't don't have have or eat. Another area uh, that's really blessing us is the face mask or the uh, safety mask <laughs> that people are making out of, uh, you know, fabric. And we just had a gal drop off a, a, a bunch of them and she's back. She says, I'm going back to make some more. So that you can go again on Calvary at Home, click it, then go down to the women's uh, ministry, click that, and as you click through, you will see where you can uh, get some information on that. You can drop them off here at Calvary. We'll have a box outside, or I just heard you can also dr dr drop them directly at Mary Washington Hospital. So if you want to engage in that, that's something you can do. I'm telling you... Uh, you go stir crazy sometimes just staying at home, but this is our opportunity as a church to be the hands and the feet, the hands and the feet to our community. How's that? All right. Okay. They're trying to fix me, man. You know, you know how that is. Get your communion elements together as well, because we'll be taking communion at the end of the study. We'll be taking communion every Wednesday until we're able to gather together and get back on our normal routine. But nothing wrong with re remembering what Christ has done for us and, and just, uh, you know, keeping people in prayer. And, and listen, let us know if you need prayer or anything. Again, you go to our website. Our address is there, our phone number. Uh, you can email us, admin at ccfred.org. Please communicate with us. And, uh, you know, we just want to be praying for you guys through this and, and others, you know. So if you're joining us, and uh, we just uh, we thank you for doing that. Second Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23. We're just about end of the second Samuel, and guess we'll be going next. That's it, first Kings. But right now we're in second Samuel chapter 23. Let's read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll pray and begin our study. Second Samuel 23, verse 1, Now these are the last words of David. Thus da says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. I like, I like that. Ordered in all things and secure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? Of course, the answer is yes, he will. But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken by hands. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of the spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. Let's pray. So, Father, again, thank you for the worship tonight, God. Thank you for gathering us in different homes, Lord God, and uh, with family and friends or maybe just, just by ourselves. But, Lord, wherever two or more are gathered, you are present. You, you love the fact, God, that we are not neglecting our time in your word, nor, nor the gathering ourselves, even though we're in different homes. But, Father, we've read, and now we ask that you give us the sense Give us the meaning, God. Speak to us, Lord. 
We've, we've tuned in. We're online just for that. We, we need a word tonight, God, in this midweek. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. So it begins here, interesting, as we continue through the book of 2 Samuel. Now, these are the last words of David. Well, these weren't the last words of David, but what is written here, what it means is this is the last psalm that David will ever pen. This is the last song that David will ever write. It's not his final exhortation. You can find that, and we'll be in there in 1 Kings chapter 2. No, no, what he's speaking of here is this is it. This is my final psalm, my last inspired psalm. Think about that. His final exhortation will be to his son when he turns the throne over to him. But here he says, these are the last words of David. David wrote 73 psalms out of the 150. Not counting last week's study. Remember we we studied, or the week before last, when we gathered in 2 Samuel 22, not including that or nor this piece here tonight. But think about how David's words, the words that he penned through the book of Psalm, Psalms, how it comforted us, and it still does, in our life. As we read the Psalms, how comforting it is. Let me ask you a, uh, a question. What is your favorite psalm? I can't hear you, but shout it out, man. <laughs> you know. I think uh, as I was studying here, I think a great devo for, for yourself or families might be, especially as we're starting to go into what would be known as the Holy Week, uh, a great devo in working through the psalms, I think, may be something that you guys might want to do. And that's Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Psalm 22 speaks of the cross. Psalm 23 speaks of the crux or the shepherd's staff. And, and Psalm 24 speaks of the crown. And it's through these three psalms, and there are other psalms, but it's interesting. They come one right after another. David here reveals Christ Jesus in all three. He reveals our Savior in all three of these psalms. He is our Savior, He is our Shepherd, and He is our King. That may be something you may want to do as a family or for your own selves. Just read it through throughout the week next week and looking at the cross, the crux, and the crown. But here David, in our reading tonight, begins to give a humble autobiography, we could say, of himself. Uh, he's compelled to do so he, by the Holy Spirit. And he just here speaks in these last words, in this last, we could say, psalm written here. He speaks of himself. And these verses, they, they speak volumes. Uh, they're, they're just filled with thought and understanding and who David sees himself to be. We know he is a man like you and I. Uh, he put his sandals on the same way we did. But he wants to speak here, compelled by the Spirit to do so, of who he is. And first he says he's the son of Jesse. Notice that. Thus says David, the son of Jesse. And whether he knew it or not, and he probably knows now, being in the heavenlies, David was elected by God in life to be part of the royal line. You know, he would write in the Psalms, and we know the Psalms writes how he, he was knitted together in his mother's womb. In other words, God had his whole life planned out for us, for him, as he does for us. But here David was born to a man by the name of Jesse. Jesse was the son of Obed, who was the son of Boaz, who married who? Ruth, that's right which would bring about the line of the tribe of Judah where Jesus would be born into. He was just a man? Yeah, he was just a man. He was the son of Jesse? Yeah, he was the son of Jesse. But he was more than that. He was one who was born into the royal line, whether he knew it or not, that would bring about, as the Bible would say, as God would tell him, the seed. The seed the one who would come to be Messiah. But humbly he says, 
I am just the son of Jesse. No, David, you were more than that. You were the anointed one. One who God anointed to bring forth through this line our Lord and Savior. And then he says here, he was raised up on high. Look at there. Thus says the man raised up on high. David knew who he was. David knew where he came from. I always like that story about the, the guy who's upset there in the airport, uh, you know, and uh, they're not giving him a, an assigned seat, and he's, he's mad, he's, he's angry. He keeps saying, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And the lady gets on the, the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, we got somebody here who doesn't know who he is. Apparently, he was somebody famous, uh, an L.A. mayor or something, and this was in the LAX. It's a true story, actually. He didn't know who he was. Well, David knew who he was. And David knew where he came from. David knew that he was just a shepherd of the sheep. He loved that, as we said before. Uh, David was reminded of this many times by God. As a matter of fact, uh, he re- uh, God would, would remind him in 1 Chronicles 17, 7, through the, through the lips of Nathan, the prophet who was assigned to David. He would tell him to say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. Notice this, 1 Chronicles 17, 7, I took you. In other words, I raised you up. I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. God wanted David to be reminded of where he came from that where he chose him, that where he raised him up from. And David knew that. David wasn't looking for nor striving for recognition or title. He was content in being a shepherd. He was fine and dandy. He would have died of a grand old age just with that crux in his hand and just before the sheep. I mean, he was fine with that. But as David looked back on his life, he knew that promotion to this high office of king. Well, it was because of God. It was only by God's selection. It was Asaph who wrote from Psalm 75, 5 through 7. He says, do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. David says, thus says the man raised up on high. I was raised up. I was available. I was obedient, but I did nothing to raise myself up. It is God who called me. God who raised me. God who used me. There was no wringing of the hands. There was no, you know, pacing back and forth. David was called out of the sheepfold by God. And sometimes we wring our hands or we go by the way of the world and it's not the way of the Lord if we're trying to get some kind of title or promotion. If we have done all that is required of us for a position or a promotion that we would like to have, then put it in the hands of God and leave it there. I'm not saying don't pursue, uh, you know, advancement and leadership just remember when you got it you got it and you're expected to uh, do what you're called to do but leave it in the hands of God allow God's will to be done because when that's done his name is lifted on high when you get that promotion or you get that raise or you or you receive a title it's God's glory it's not yours It's not yours. And this is what David is saying here in 2B. Thus says the man raised on high. Then he goes on. Notice he says, the anointed of God of Jacob. The anointed, empowered by God, he says here. He is God's anointed. He knows that. When David was called to be king of Israel, the calling came with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I was reading a Twitter uh, the other day by a, a guy and and, you know, it may just have been the way he wrote it. And, you know, sometimes I speak. It don't make sense. But anyway, but he said this. Listen, 
When I decided to be a pastor, I said, whoa, when you decided to be a pastor? Again, it could just be me reading this. But I think he got it wrong. That decision is of the Lord alone. It's of the Lord alone. All we got to do when he puts it in our heart, the call comes, is to be obedient, to step forward in it. Now, maybe he didn't mean that, but when I read, when I read it, I thought this is something that I need to understand myself as well. The call is of the Lord, guys, the Lord alone. He puts that desire in our heart, and then he works it out in his time. He works it out in his time. Let's not get ahead of God. Let's not get behind in disobedience, but be right where God wants us. Turn to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Turn your Bibles there. It's here where we learned uh, how David was called. I just want, want us to be reminded of this, kind of remind us of his calling and his anointing. Samuel, in the background here, the backstory, Samuel, as you know, was dispatched to Jesse's house, who had many sons, and he was dispatched there to anoint the new king of Israel. Yeah, King Saul, man, he just blew it one after another. He wasn't obedient. He wasn't walking with the Lord. Here was a, a self-made man and a self-made king, truly. But it wasn't told to Samuel as he went who it was that was going to be the next king of Israel. Picking it up there in 1 Samuel 16, looking at verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and he went to where? To Bethlehem. That's another key thing there. I love it. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? (laughs) Why are they trembling? Were they doing something wrong? But anyway. And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And verse 6 says, So it was when when they came that that he looked at Eliab. This is Samuel looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have what? I have refused him. For the Lord, and guys, I hope this is underlined in your Bible. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That is that is key right there, man. The Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hasn't chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is. Doing what, guys? Keeping the sheep. There he is, keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. (laughs) And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Imagine that. Here's this ruddy kid. He's got, you know, bright eyes, probably blue eyes and uh, red hair, they say. I don't know. But he was good looking. I know that, but... Anyway, he says, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Did David have anything to do with this? He was available. He was watching over the sheep. And respectfully, I tell you guys, and you know this, we, his people, are considered like sheep. David knew how to deal with sheep. David knew what it was to be dedicated, caring for them. He knew what it was to be the shepherd, and that's who God wanted. Somebody who cared, who was out there, who wasn't about all the busyness or looking for a title. That's the calling. 
And God called him, and God brought him, and God used him. Why do you think David, though, notice again in verse there, 1C, the anointed of God of Jacob. Why do you think David wrote of himself the anointed of God of Jacob? Why did he say the anointed of God of Israel? Think about that. I've got something here that I'll, I'll teach you. You, know, you may have your own interesting thought about that, but we know that Jacob, when his name means what? Heel catcher, right? Um, one who is clever. Uh, one who trips up another. Uh, one who isn't perfect. Yeah, you know, good old, good old uh, Jacob. God, we know, renamed him Israel. But throughout his life, we see sometimes in the Old Testament, when, when Israel's in the flesh, he's called Jacob. And when Jacob's walking with the Lord, he'll be called Israel. But I believe this speaks to how God calls the unqualified of this world. Again, as he said here, man looks at the outward, God looks at the heart. And all with this imperfectness of Jacob, God still called him, and God still used him. And I believe that here is just speaking of how God calls the unqualified of the world and qualifies him by his anointing power. David in this last psalm knew that God didn't want perfect as that worship song goes. God didn't want perfect. God didn't want perfection. God wanted David's heart. God wanted Jacob's heart. God wanted to use them. And the same God who took Jacob and made him Israel's prince took David and made him Israel's what? His king. Is he perfect? No. Does he have a heart after God? Yes. That's what he wants of us, guys. He's not looking for perfect. He's looking for one who loves him from the deepest of his heart, devotionally, devotionally loves him, all in all, man. Well, I love the next title that David gives himself, if I can say it that way, the sweet psalmist and the sweet psalmist of Israel. I think David, and I, I, I believe this, would have been satisfied just being that shepherd, but as that shepherd, you know this, he, he was the psalmist. He was the songwriter. He calls himself the psalmist of Israel. God not only anointed David to lead Israel as their king, but also inspired him by the Holy Spirit to write psalms for Israel. I think he would have been content out there with his guitar, out there with his, you know, uh, instrument, out there among the sheep, singing out to the the star singing to God. He would be just content to do that. But God had another plan for King David. It seems this is what David wants to be remembered for, though. As Israel's composer, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Psalms, guys, as you know, and I can't wait till we get into the Psalms. I know Tom's went to uh, Africa and taught through the Psalms because the, the Psalms, man, they, 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 were, they were Israel's and now for all believers, they, it, it, that book is our prayer book. It's our worship hymnal. Look at many of the songs that we sing, the worship songs that are written, our scripture, and many of them come from the book of Psalms. They speak to us. They speak for us, don't they? When, when you just don't know what to say, when you just don't know what to do, how, how, what words, you begin to, to read the Psalms and you, and you begin to say, yes, that's, that's what I want to say. It speaks for us. It speaks to us. It honors God who is holy, just, graceful, and merciful. And, and it tells the story of David and the other psalmists. They tell the story of Israel and God doesn't hold anything back. It's without reservations and we need to read those things because many times we come to the scripture, oh God, I've blown it again. Lord, I've, I, I've stumbled again. But guys, listen, but you've opened the word 
and you begin to read, especially the Psalms, and you think, man, that's me. That's, yes, God. Yes, that's me. He holds nothing back. David's life is wide open, man, for all of us to read and to just see his relationship with God. I know the Psalms are a blessing to read through them and to be comforted by them. And in these days that we're living today, I would encourage you, begin to study through the Psalms. Allow them to speak to you, and they'll speak to you right where you're at, right where you're at. Well, now after David is done giving kind of an autobiography of who he really is, telling us, uh, directed by the Spirit to write this psalm, notice that David now shares with us those intimate moments when God spoke directly to him. He's given us a glimpse of it. He's He's, he's inspired to tell us how this all went, as how he wrote and as God anointed him and as the Holy Spirit directed him and in order to write what God wants man to know. He says, look at there in verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord, that is the Holy Spirit, spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. I love how he writes. Verse 3, the God, that's speaking of Father of Israel, said, the rock, the son of God, of Israel, spoke to me. You, you, you get a glimpse of the Trinity there. The spirit of the Lord, the God, the rock. We know that Jesus was that rock. We see the triune God of the, in the Old Testament there. But here all three of them are involved in David's uh, composition of being the sweet psalmist of Israel. His compositions, his writings. And here he tells us, that the word, his word, was on my tongue. And if it's on his tongue, David had to compose it. He had to write it out. This is what he was called to do. You have heard it said that God uh, could have used angels, right? He could have used rocks, created the creation rocks to speak for him. But he chose to use men. He chose to inspire men by the Holy Spirit to speak and write for him. In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man. There it is. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by who? By the Holy Spirit. David is sharing this with us. David is kind of showing us how this worked for him. As the words came to his tongue, he would compose it. He would write it down, being led by the Spirit. You know 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work that speaks of the whole of the Bible. For David, as the sweet psalmist of Israel, that spoke of writing their hymnal, writing the prayer book of Israel. And he wrote it in obedience to what God spoke to him. So David gives us an insight as to how God would speak to him to write out a message, a warning, a precept, a principle, a blessing for us to speak to us and to speak for us through a psalm. And then he speaks to us of the message here. He speaks to us of the message that God has given to him, specifically in this section. Notice that this message, this inspired message that he is writing is dealing with leading and ruling because in the context, that's what David is speaking. I am, I am the son of Jesse. I am the man raised on high. I am the anointed of Jacob. Jacob, I am the sweet psalmist of Israel. I am the king. I am in leadership. I'm in God's leadership. And now he speaks of that message and the message is dealing with leading, is dealing with ruling. How we are to lead others. Again, we go back to that leadership aspect. And how David is to lead Israel. 
Because it's these same qualities that we will read here in a second or liken unto God, how God leads us, how this sweet shepherd led the sheep and Israel and how God, how God leads us as his sheep. It says here, notice, first of all, he rules over men. Uh, he rules over men. Uh, I'm, I'm not reading that. Let me read that again in verse uh, yeah, he who rules over men must be just. Somebody messed with my notes. I think it was Seth. He, he who rules over men must be just. The word just is lawful. The word just is righteous. Ruling, guys, in the fear of God. I don't know, no man or woman in ministry and leadership, and, and especially in the church, who doesn't see that. That, that in giving a task or in giving or having this calling that we're living out and accepting, uh, accepting a, a role of leader that you don't realize, man, I've got to do this in a righteous way, in the fear of God. Isaiah 45, 21 tells us this. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from the ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no other God beside me? A just God and Savior, there is none beside me. He is the just God. He is a righteous God. All that he does is righteous and lawful. All that he does, and he expects us who are in rulership, whether we're a parent, whether we're a grandparent, whether we're in ministry, or wherever he has us in leadership to rule, we must rule, we must be just. He goes on and says, verse 4, and he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises. I love that. Again, David being very poetic here as he's writing. See, guys, what he's saying here, as I see it, is God brings the difference between night and day. God brings the difference between darkness and light. A leader should do that as well. When the leader comes into a room, when a leader comes into a, a situation, people shouldn't think, uh-oh, here comes that cloud, that black cloud. You've been at work and said, no, that. All of a sudden, you know, the, the supervisor comes. All of a sudden, the CEO comes in, and it's like a black cloud. That shouldn't be. That should never be. It should brighten our day. Besides, we shouldn't want to be scared or, or hide against anything if we're doing the right thing. Again, Isaiah 60, 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. That's what God brings to us. He brings this wonderful light of the morning. Hey, it may have been rough last night, but the light of the morning is coming. And this is what God brings. A leader who follows God's pattern for ruling gives the people they are leading hope. Gives them hope when they see us. When we look at the president coming on TV, when we look at his crew and his, you know, his task force and things like that, you know, we're looking for hope. We're listening for hope, especially in the days that we're living in for our country. Now, our hope is in God. Don't get me wrong. It's in Christ. But he is, to, he is our leader, right? He is the president. We're seeking hope for the nation. But for that leader, he believes in his helper and that God that he serves, and hence he should be bringing, we should be bringing this hope, this light. Notice it says also, God is a morning without clouds. Like a new day, man, without clouds. Placing uh, anxieties and afflictions or dress, distress uh, not upon his people. Not coming in with clouds again, but bringing the morning, the new day, man. Uh, his mercies are new what? Every morning. That's what we should be bringing. Not holding on to, to gr things that were done yesterday. But coming in with a, a new outlook, a new, a new uh, spring morning, you know, to the people. Like the tender grass, he continues on. Like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after the rain. Again, David is speaking out of experience, and God is anointing these words. 
David knows what it is to be out in the field. He knows when it, this morning comes without clouds. What a joyous day it is. He knows about that. He knows about the tender grass springing out of the earth by the clear shining after the rain. As he leads like his God, the people flourish with hope. And the fruit of their obedience will be rewarded. No doubt in reading these verses, David is also speaking of the yet promised kingdom to come. That by God's word, his covenant to David will come to pass. Notice verse 5. Although my house is not so with God, yet, he says, he has made with me an everlasting covenant. Although my house is not so with God. David is recognizing his personal failure as a king, and the nation's failure in loyalty, trust, and obedience to God. We've seen a bit of that as we studied through Samuel. We know David's falling and David's imperfectness. We know by this time, uh, as we get into kings, that Israel will be divided. There's civil war. There's disobedience. And David is saying, God... Although my house is not with God, in a sense, uh, it's not perfect. I recognize my personal failures. I also recognize the nation's perfect failure. But listen to this. He says, yet. Just wanted to wake some of you guys up. That's a wonderful adverb, yet. It is, man. It speaks of a a specified time. Notice, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. God's covenant was not based on David's performance. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God's covenant, when he gave his covenant, it wasn't going to be based on, on how good David was. I'm making a list. I'm checking it twice. I'm going to see who's not. No, God's covenant, his promise, wasn't based on Israel's obedience. What was it based on? His word. It was based on his word alone. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to go out and get crazy and, 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 and you know, and, you know just, just be nuts. And then, you know, because there's consequences to all that. And David had strong consequences. And Israel would have con- strong consequences consequences because of their failure in obedience. But the promise of the coming Messiah is what this covenant was, who will build a God a house, and that it will last forever, is based solely upon God's word. He says, for this, notice this, he says, for this is all my salvation and all my desire. David's just sharing his heart here. David is telling us, guys, the importance of this covenant. Faith in this new covenant depended upon the security of Israel. He says, that's all I want for Israel and for myself. Salvation, security, that's my desire. That's my heart's desire. As I lead Israel, as I care for man, that's my full desire. To see them safe, to see them have the same desire that I do. And you know that throughout the centuries before the advent of Christ, the Bible speaks, history speaks, and tells us, tells us how Satan and his minions try to destroy Israel and the line of the tribe of Judah. We, we spoke of, uh, last Sunday I believe, we spoke of how Jesus was sent into the desert and how he was tempted what was Satan trying to do? He was trying to get him to bow the knee to him. Really, guys, he was trying to get him from going to the cross. He was trying to get him from going to that cross, from keeping the, full, the total fulfillment of this covenant. And we've seen that in history, how the enemy is trying to keep, was trying to keep the tribe of Judah from fulfilling this covenant, and the other prophecies that were spoken of. Yet it was their faith in this covenant that kept them going on. Just think of the history, World War II, all those things that those people went through and more. But they had hope of this Messiah was sure to come. And this is what David is saying. It's my salvation. It's my desire, man. It says... 
will he not make it increase? Of course, that's a a rhetorical question that demands a, well, yes, he will. He will make it increase. Jesus did come bringing eternal salvation for all peoples. This covenant of grace through Jesus alone who fulfilled it by giving of his life on the cross. As he gave his life, as he died, it increased. People came to faith. As he rose again on the third day, yes, the fruit of his obedience did increase. Will he not make it? He answer is, yes, he will make it increase. Yes, he will fulfill it. Yes, it will come to pass, and it has come to pass, because what God says will come to pass, because he put his word above his name. He will make it increase. He, he will, and he has. Again, Isaiah wrote in 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The branch is Jesus. And through him, much fruit will come. Men and women and youth and children bearing fruit, fruit of salvation, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit within themselves as they, as they work out their salvation, as we'll get to that in Philippians, what God has worked in. They will have testimony. They will live a holy lifestyle. They will serve the Lord. There will be obedience. And we're seeing that in our local church and in the churches all over us. The people who are saved begin to bear that fruit, begin to speak of their Savior and tell others of eternal life. But he gets to verse 6 as we wrap it up with a but. And this sets a contrast contrast that we just spoke of, the godly, the righteous with the unrighteous. He calls them the sons of rebellion shall be as thorns. You see, friends, listen. There is good news of the gospel, but there's also the bad news of those who reject it. Here he calls the thorns on the unrighteous. He says that they will be thrust away. You know the thorns. It's a sign of the what? Of the curse. Read Genesis. It was a sign of the curse in the garden. It speaks of the unrepentant, those that refuse Christ. Before we get high-minded, I'll remind you that we were all thorns at one time, but we turned to Christ. So why? Why won't they turn to Christ? Why have they refused Christ? It's not that people haven't shared with them. It's not that they don't have the Word of God. It's not that they have a Bible available to them or tracts, but I'll tell you why. It says there, because they cannot be taken with hands. You've worked in the garden. You've worked with roses. You've worked around things like this. Thorns can't be handled. You get pricked. You get cut. Thorns cannot be gently dealt with. And neither those who refuse to hear the gospel of salvation. Guys, sometimes all we can do, and I don't want to put it this way, but... All we can do is pray. We can pray for them. Well, it seems like it's hopeless here. He's writing. No, no, no. Paul was a, Paul was a thorn in the Christian church. Paul was a thorn himself. But even a thorn can be broken before the Lord. And Paul became a Christian. And God used him mightily. He says in verse 7, But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of the spear. You've got to use leather gloves, le- leather gloves, right? You've got to use sharp utensils. When you're in the garden, when you find that uh, some thorns have come in, into your garden, into your roses, you've got to use certain equipment to protect yourself. There must be, uh, you know, and you must force, uh, use force to cut them away. All this speaks of is what David is telling us is judgment. Verse 7 speaks of judgment there, verse 7a. And then verse 7b, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. This speaks of their sentencing. There's judgment and there's sentencing. If they don't change from their rebellious ways, if they don't become righteous, and the righteousness comes from Christ. That's only from Christ alone. Through repentance, 
and receiving him as Savior. The Bible says they will be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says that. The question is, where do you stand tonight? Think about that. Are you a thorn? Or are you one who is righteous? Where do you stand tonight? Are you with Christ, being without thorns? Or are you with thorns, being without Christ? You can change that tonight. And before we go to the Lord's table, I'm going to say a prayer. And if you're out there, wherever you are, you can pray and receive Jesus Christ and change that as Paul was changed and you can be with Christ. Have that hope of salvation, man. Eternal life. And turn your darkness into light. And start walking, man, on the path of righteousness. Oh, we still have struggles. We still have, you know, flu. We'll still have, uh, you know, effects from pollen. We're not exempt from that. But let me tell you, man, we're on our way to heaven. You have a new citizenship a new citizenship in heaven. You want that? You want to be free? Just pray with me. Father, forgive me of my sins. I receive your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. I'm in need of a Savior, God. Come into my life right now, God. I believe what your word says, that you will save me from the guttermost to the uttermost. So I receive you right now. Just say a simple prayer, guys. I receive you right now. Come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we want to put a Bible in your hand for free. Go on that website, ccfred.org. You'll have our address, our phone numbers, and our email. Just email and say, hey, I prayed with the pastor. I'd like to have this Bible. This is an interesting Bible. You may have one, but it's an interesting Bible. It has all of the answers to many of your questions and it's been updated greg laurie has updated it and he's got some great insights to help you on your way so again go to our website you'll find our phone number our email admin at ccfred.org or uh our uh what else well everything you need just send us your address tell us you prayed and we'd love to send you this bible well, at this point, we want to go before the Lord in communion. So if you got your, all your elements together, let's just do that. All that we talked about tonight really comes to this, the Lord's table. Jesus wants us to remember him because he knows we forget. Especially in these days we're living, again, I don't want to keep saying that, but this last week and stuff, we have a tendency to forget, sometimes get our eyes off of the Lord and all that he's done for us. Somebody, you know, there's a lot of jokes going around or, or truth that, you know, our parents, my parents went through the Great Depression. You know, they, they learned to live with practically nothing. Well, beans and rice in Jesus Christ. But... It's a time where we remember Jesus and all that he's. Let's not forget what he's done. He loves us. He cares for us. He bled for us. He died for us so that we would have eternal life. Our citizenship isn't here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. But until that time, until he calls us home or we are caught up with him in the air, he expects us to be faithful and honoring him, helpful and sharing with your neighbors. So, Father, we thank you for your son. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience. As we look at the elements, the bread that speaks of your body given for us, broken for us, the cup that speaks of your blood that was shed on that cross, the cup of the new covenant, the covenant that was spoken of so many years ago, of coming to pass, and that through your blood, Jesus. The enemy thought you were dead, you were gone, you were buried, no longer to be heard of. And on the third day, you rose again. For with that, we're so grateful. Because you said, I will not eat nor drink. I will not have, partake of this with you until you come into my Father's kingdom, which gives us hope. 
It gives us hope. There's life after death. And we received you as Lord and Savior. And we remember your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake. God bless you guys. Intro to 